Let us turn to Psalm 13. Psalm 13 is uh, really a psalm of encouragement for the depressed, for those that are in despair. And it's a psalm of David, and it begins with verse 1, saying, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? The despair that David experienced was because he felt that God had forgotten him and distanced himself from him. It is similar to the sentiment that we read in Psalm 10, verse 1. Our joy is the presence of the Lord. And when that seems absent, then that's disturbing. When we know that God is with us, we can face great trouble. But when we feel distant from him, then the smallest thing can send us into despair. Actually, to be absent from God, that is true hell. Uh, Paul writes uh, to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? To be punished with absence of God is true hell. Now, when we distance ourselves from God, we can always run back to Him, like a child runs back to its mother, or like the prodigal son ran back to his father. But David felt that God was hiding from him, and he felt powerless. And David's critical question here is, how long? How long? He couldn't bear any longer, and he repeats this question, how long, four times in verses 1 and 2. It's a cry of despair. He desired very much uh, for this abandonment of God to end. One may be able to endure trouble when it's uh, clear how long it lasts. But not knowing how long something lasts can make it totally unbearable. And that is what David experienced. Now the thing is that David felt that God had forgotten him that God was hiding from him. It was very real to David. It was real according to his feelings, not according to fact. Of course, God didn't forget David. In Isaiah 49 verse 16, it says, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yet they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. So here it's not a person, it's Zion, it's uh, Jerusalem um, that uh, wonders whether God has uh, forsaken them. It's after um, or at the end of the Babylonian captivity where Jerusalem is, um, is largely destroyed, the walls are broken down, and um, the temple is destroyed. And this is their cry, has God forgotten us? But God says, no. I've written you on the palm of my hands. That means every time I see you. Your name is here. And he even says, um, thy walls are continually before me. Now, the the children of Israel, they saw only ruins, not walls. But God says, I see walls. I see already the end result. And this is also on a personal level. We may be in shambles and we see only ruins and misery, but God already sees the end result. He already sees where it's going and he has not forgotten. God had not hidden his face from David, but David felt like it. Such strong feelings create their own reality. Now, feelings are a gift from God. They are a sign that we are made in His image. We can feel anger and love, care, joy, sorrow, awe, bewilderment, etc. And these feelings are part of our relationship, our interaction with God. For example, uh, we have fear of the Lord. Or we have sorrow over sins. Or we may pray with passion. Or we rejoice in the Lord. We love the Lord. 
we care for our neighbor, we have compassion. All these are feelings. Without feelings it is not possible to have a real relationship. However, it is wrong when our life is ruled by feelings. Or when we believe whatever, the fe the, whatever reality, quote-unquote reality, these feelings present. And the problem here is twofold. Um, the first is that our feelings are affected by our fallenness. And so, apart from all the positive feelings that I, I mentioned, and there are many more of course, there are also feelings like anxiety, depression, hatred, selfishness. And we make, may seek satisfaction in generating feelings of pleasure, joy. Um, and that can be in many ways, but we do it just for self, to satisfy ourselves. It may be in addictions, or it can even be in worshipping the Lord, quote-unquote, um, because in reality that is often self-worship. It is to, to generate a feeling in ourselves that we are doing well. Uh, this can also come out in uh, philanthropy, for example. Uh, to create this feeling, I'm, I'm doing something good, and one starts to feel better about him or herself. There is an accomplishment, satisfaction. So we can use feelings in the wrong way, and feelings can use us in the wrong way. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that our feelings can easily be um, affected by and influenced by the devil's demons. And that can happen either directly or indirectly through people or circumstances around us. So uh, you see the danger there. The lesson here is that it's okay to have these feelings, as David did, um, but we should bring them to God, by the way, as David also did. But we should never accept the reality of feelings as real. We can't Trust them that way. David continues in verse 2. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? First of all, we see that David had despair with himself. And there's no wonder he was taking counsel in his own soul, it says. And that had led him to sorrow daily. And this is what we do when we face problems. We think about them. They are all the time in our minds. Uh, we may have sleepless nights uh, thinking about all our problems. Uh, it's actually hard work. It's hard work to think about your problems. And the more we think about them, the more depressed we get. The answer actually is not looking inside uh, yourself. The answer is looking to the Lord. When we pray about our problems and truly leave them with God, he gives us release and peace. Peter writes about this in 1 Peter 5 verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. These words are so comforting. Casting your cares, not some of them, not the worst ones, but all, he says, upon him. Why? Because he cares. And because he cares, he will take care. And in Psalm 55, verse 22, it says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. If we bring our problems to the Lord, he shall sustain us. It's a promise. So David was depressed in his relationship with the Lord. Uh, he was uh, depressed with himself. And thirdly, he was depressed with his enemies, as he also mentions here. He was depressed with his enemies because they were God's enemies. It was time to stop looking inside himself and to start looking at God. The only way out of this depression was to give it to the Lord, to stop complaining and to start praying. And that would answer the question, how long? So, David brings it to the Lord. He prays. Verse 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. 
David felt that God was distant, that God was not listening. And now in his despair, he cries out, consider me and hear me. And this repetition shows emphasis. It's a passionate cry. And God often waits until our prayers become desperate before he answers. Prayers are often powerless because they lack desperation. They lack passion. As if we expect God to care about things that we don't really care about. It's not that we need to convince God by giving a display of, uh, of passion, some theater, but our desperation and our passion um, demonstrates that we care about the things that God cares about. It's really an opposite attitude. And only when we bring things uh, before the Lord with the right attitude, with the right heart, we will also bring the right things before God. And he will answer. It's a promise. Jesus says in John 15 verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. The key word here is the first word, if. If you uh, abide in me. If that is so, then we will ask the right things and we will also ask them with the right attitude. And he will answer. Now David asked God to enlighten his eyes. His vision was clouded and dark. His feelings had created an alternative reality. And that had to go. He needed again to see things God's way. If not, it would eventually lead to spiritual death, which ultimately leads to eternal death. And this only shows that Satan knows very well what he is doing. By influencing our feelings, he's trying to make us spiritually dead, knowing that that will lead to our eternal death. And that's what he wants. But having the light of God shine upon us, giving us his wisdom and knowledge, is essential for our spiritual survival. Paul makes it clear in his epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 1 verse 17 through 19. He says there that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So he says here, uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This is of key importance. Uh, to be spiritually enlightened by the light of Christ is the opposite of spiritual death. Uh, later in the, his epistle, uh, in the same epistle, he says um, in chapter 5 verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Before we have received the light of Christ, we are dead. That is what it says. And so David continues uh, in verse 4, Psalm 13, Lest mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. Now we see here how correct David's prayer was, because he sees that once God would enlighten his eyes, he would no longer be depressed with himself, but also not with his enemies. When the light of God shines in our life, all shadows disappear. Oh yes, when he would stay in that depressed mode, his enemies would certainly gloat over his fall and rejoice. But now, with the eyes of understanding enlightened, he knew their end. And more importantly, he knew his end. Rather, his eternal destiny. So he continues, verse 5. But I have trusted in thy mercy. Now that his eyes are enlightened, now that he shook off the fake reality that his feelings projected, now he remembers that he did trust God's mercy. And he can trust it again. And he can always trust it. It's like having a sleepless night, worrying about problems. And then in the morning when you get out of bed, all does not really seem that bad. And solutions begin to present themselves. 
When all else fails, we may trust God's mercy. And it's better actually to trust God's mercy before all else fails. But that means that we um, do not receive the bad that we deserve. That is what his mercy does. He continues then, second half, verse 5. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord. Now you read this, you may say, wait a minute. It's again about feelings. Rejoice, feelings of joy and to sing. Yes, it's again about feelings. But now David uh, directs his feelings toward the reality in God instead of having his feelings direct him into a false reality. He's rejoicing in God's salvation. This is the ultimate uh, joy of every believer. Because of that gift of grace, for by grace you have been saved, we may trust in his mercy. Because we accepted that which we don't deserve, which is salvation, we no longer get that which we deserve which are the wages of sin. That is grace and mercy at work. And there is all the reason to rejoice. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation, the salvation of God. Salvation in Hebrew is Shua, the Shua of Yahweh. We would say in Hebrew, Yahoshua. That is actually what it says there. So David then expresses his rejoicing in singing. Uh, Singing, making music was one of the talents that God had given him and he uses this talent to praise the Lord. That is actually why we receive talents, uh, to use them for God. Um, So he sings with joy to the Lord. He sings unto the Lord. Not about the Lord or to himself, but to the Lord. Singing is a wonderful way to express uh, our joy, but also to increase our joy. It works both ways. Uh, Again to uh, the epistle of Ephesians in chapter 5 verse 19, Paul writes, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So he also speaks here about singing and making melody to the Lord. But he also says speaking to yourself. That's interesting um, because when you sing psalms and hymns, it's also good to listen to actually what you sing and not just sing without thinking and have all these uh, repetitions of these, uh, um, these hollow phrases often. But um, real hymns and psalms, they have content and it's good to listen because then actually we are through our own mouth uh, speaking to ourselves or allowing God's word to speak to us. Um, David had totally transitioned from feeling abandoned by the Lord to singing for joy to the Lord. And now in order to feel abandoned, you have to have someone to be abandoned by. And you need to have experienced the presence of that person first. And that testifies of a relationship. Our feelings may make us forget that we are in a relationship. Assume that you are, I hope that you are, because that's what what faith is all about. But God still loves us and will be faithful to us, regardless of our feelings. And the last part then, uh, verse 6, second half. Because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Now that David's eyes are enlightened, he sees that God has actually dealt bountifully with him. He had all the reason to sing and rejoice. God had been good to him. David had allowed his feelings to change his perspective. And he had problems with God, with himself and with others. But now he sees that God had dealt bountifully with him all along. But before David came to that place, he had to realize that he didn't see everything. And he had to realize and admit that his feelings were not giving him accurate information. 
And that is a great lesson to us in times of trouble. Amen. Amen.